but uh, say a few words. Okay, um, we're here during a solar eclipse and we're going to shed some light on nuclear power. Good. Um, I've always been a science person. The library was my second home when I grew up. And uh, I've been writing articles on science for years. My first four books were all pro-science in varying degree, even though one of them, a bestseller, was basically travel adventure. Um, but my fifth book, and I'm proud of those four, but my fifth book, Unintended Consequences, the lie that killed millions and accelerated climate change is by far the most important. And so I'm here today to speak on it and to, to hope to get people to buy the book, read it and recommend it because we have to convince the public that their fears of nuclear power are unfounded. It's not good enough to just tell them, oh, you don't have to worry about that. We have to tell them why. If we tell why, I find that in the programs I give, the public is really receptive if you can explain it at a level that is easily understood. And as I travel the country with these programs, I've had really good success and good response from general audiences. Glad to hear it. Uh, what, uh, give us an example of some of where you've chosen to speak. I usually speak at universities or colleges or affinity groups like um, Isaac Walton League um, or the Plato Club in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, actually, over the last 12 months, I figured it out before I came down here. I've spoken to about 4,000 people and about 1,000 of those are seniors. And uh, so I have people at all levels from basically uh, 18 up through seniors. And I'm pleased to say that the young people are more receptive than I expected. What years did you um, become aware of nuclear energy as a solution? Well, I used to be one of those people that didn't think about it. I, when uh, these alternatives came along, I thought, oh, isn't that wonderful? And uh, I didn't do the math. I didn't do what I should have done. But uh, then, uh, about six years ago, I read an article in Popular Science that features John Cooch, Cooch and the Thorium Energy Alliance. And that's when I joined the Alliance. And I got involved with Alex Canera's email group. Uh, Alex lives on the West Coast. And he's a very prolific writer. And uh, since then, I have had one heck of an education. Even though I, was, um, I had a decent science education, I had a huge upgrade and as I came to put all these input together from different engineers, physicists, uh, radiation professionals, uh, I came to realize that there's a story here and that story would really be easily told if it was put in order and, it, and written in a way that the general public easily understands with images and with simple graphs, not complicated graphs, graphs that you can look at in three seconds, you can get the conclusion from. And that's what I put in the book, Unintended Consequences, which is available on Amazon um, as a Kindle or paper, paperback. Can you describe the reaction you're getting? Like if you, um, you know, you go into a conference or into a, a, a setting with an audience and you're, um, and you do your talk, um, do you provide a, a, a period for question answers? Yes, I always do. And I think it's the most, re often is the most rewarding part of the program because it's important for me to say what I think, but it's very important for me to hear what people, their unanswered questions, their fears. And uh, I not only take time to answer them to the best of my ability, which is pretty good, I tell them. If I can't give you an answer, I will get somebody who can, and I will have them get a hold of you. And I give them my email address, and uh, I have had very few people that have ever had to rely on that. Yeah. But I always offer it because I don't know it all. Mm. And uh, I don't, I like to stay factual. I don't like to exaggerate. 
And so I try to stick to the facts, and if I can't cover it, I put them in touch with somebody who can. I think it's, it's, it's good that, a, um, say, a non-scientist is teaching people about important scientific information. That is right, absolutely. Yeah. I find that it's very important for people in the field to talk to each other. But these people have got to start writing op-eds, writing letters, and taking the time to put together a program and talk to the general public the way I have done. Because we got a lot of generals. We don't need more generals. We need troops. And the public is the troops if we're going to um, effect changes in our attitude about how we produce electricity. Um, and we can't burn more carbon. Uh, do you find that people are generally um, have lost hope and that you sometimes introduce hope? Like the, That's a tough one. Yeah. Um, the book I wrote, Unintended Consciousness, is a grim book. No two ways about it. Um, yes, I do tell them that we have time if we get moving. The problem is most people remain unconvinced uh, or are presently unconvinced. And unless we get moving soon, we are in deep trouble, particularly because of the oceans and the acidification that is already occurring that is bringing us close to permanently damage, damaging the oceans that give us 20% of our protein and 50% of our oxygen. So I tell them, if you're in favor of breathing, give some thought to the oceans. There is a, um, a problem we have, and that is the timing that people perceive the worst will happen. There, a lot of the people you speak to, they think they're going to be dead before the worst happens. And they lose perhaps in interest in the solution because they think they won't be here when the worst happens. Do you have a way to wake people up and make them more uh, concerned? I hope so. We have to realize that we've created this mess, not deliberately, um, but we've got to own up to it. And to say that, well, I won't be here, so it won't affect me, is really awfully self-centered. Um, I think we have a responsibility to the future generations to do everything to as rapidly as possible stop using carbon, stop burning carbon, and uh, expand nuclear power because it's carbon dioxide free, it's efficient, it's a lot of life. The waste problem is nowhere like what it's dressed up to be. And if we recycle the waste and use it as fuel, uh, it's even less of a problem. So there are many ways that we can mitigate climate change. We're not going to cancel it. I don't think that'll happen. We have to start a battle now if we're going to make a significant change in its effect within 10 years. And that's tough. Pure radiation. Right. That began in the 30s when Herman Muller exposed fruit flies mm -hmm. to the equivalent of a thousand mammograms of radiation in a few minutes, which was extreme, and he called it a low dose, and it wasn't. And then he said radiation is harmful all the way down to zero without experimenting. It was a, it was a an assumption. And he also said it's harmful and it's cumulative. We now know, because our science has advanced so much, that it's not cumulative if it's spread out over a long time. And it is not harmful at low levels. In fact, there are even low levels that can help um, the body. Right. And this has been proven. This is not conjecture or a guess. Mm -hmm. um, when when uh, radiation oncologists are in some types of tumors are about to treat a patient, they will give them a low dose of radiation ahead of time, which seems to stimulate their natural repair me mechanisms. And those people do better. I think an important point to remember is that because all radioactive elements decay at a half-life, so many years from now they're half as potent, 
That means that our species evolved during times of higher radiation. In other words, you go backwards in time. Here, this, this element is now much more aggressive. Back farther, double more aggressive. And so our bodies, we now know, developed natural defense mechanisms. Um, we didn't know that in the 30s. We didn't know it in the 50s. We know it now, but by now we have such fear of radiation that's been promulgated by people like Helen Caldicott um, and groups that profit from fear of, net, of uh, radiation. Groups like some of the green organizations that started out with the best of intentions but now will not change their minds, will not listen to programs on this because they have a vested interest in staying at the top and they have an income base they do not want to offend. There was a book called Terrestrial Energy where the author of the book, Terrestrial Energy, have you heard of it? Uh, uh, it no. was um, about um, how the uh, nuclear energy or decay in the middle of the earth mm -hmm. um, um, allows us to maintain a magnetic field. Mm -hmm. That was just one of the things he talks about. Mm -hmm. And that magnetic field is dependent on the fact that there is such a thing as radiation and radioactive decay, yep. and that it, um, it deflects the solar rays from the sun. And the idea that you could have, um, that we survive and we continue to exist because otherwise, without radiation, we would our planet would perish. That's right. And they have shown with certain organisms, if they take them from a normal situation with normal background radiation, and they shield them from all radiation, they don't do well. <laughs> That's really something. I want to take the moment to recommend two books. One of them is The Rise of Nuclear Fear. Excellent book. And the second one, which has a very cartoonish cover, that is kind of unfortunate because it's an excellent book is called Green Jacked, like hijacked, Green Jacked. And it tells how the environmental movements hijacked um, the anti-nuclear uh, uh, ethic. Sure. Um, and they're both very good books. I highly recommend them. Good. You can find them on Amazon. Uh, hold that up in front of your uh, okay. face a little higher, yeah. And um, I, this is your book. Uh, this is the one that you've right. recently written, very right. recently. Came out uh, late in March, early April. Um, and as I say, it's my most important. Uh, say the title. The title is Unintended Consequences, The Lie That uh, Killed Millions and Accelerated Climate Change. And the lie that I refer to is Herman Muller, who eventually was awarded a Nobel Prize for his work because he knew, because of other researchers that disagreed with him, that there was dispute about his claim of no safe level. He knew it. He praised their work. He said, we're going to have to investigate this further. But he never did. And he went before the Nobel crowd and he said, there can be no doubt that his theory was correct, that there was no safe level of radiation. And uh, he based it on his studies of the fruit fly, was it? Initially, yes, uh, which he irradiated, irradiated with a, a thousand mammograms worth of radiation in th about three minutes. It's a colossal dose. Uh, it's no wonder they had uh, uh, mutations, <laughs> but uh, um, he did no investigation below those levels. And so these radiation standards that became dogma, became scientific dogma, were based on a lie. They are now under review. There's a petition before the NRC um, to have the, our standards raised to reflect current scientific thinking. Right now, that li the li limit is down around one millisievert per year. That's minuscule. Science tells us 100 is reasonable. The current people appealing the ruling are asking for 50, and I think we'll be lucky to get it, and that's a shame. Mm -hmm. It's a shame particularly because, for example, in India, there are people who live where the background ratio varies from 300 
to 500 millisieverts per year. Mm -hmm. And they have no higher cancer rates. They're just as healthy as everyone else. But that's ignored and it's not known. We're trying to publicize these events. And the misconceptions about um, how much radiation it takes to actually affect us. Right. Uh, yeah. We, we have not understood that our bodies have natural defenses, repair mechanisms that go like that mm -hmm. automatically. When I first read the MIT study, or, or heard about the MIT study that said that uh, DNA is damaged 10,000 times a day per cell, I thought that's crazy. That's got to be a decimal point way up. So I went to the MIT study, and that's exactly right. All the time, we are being bombarded by radiation, and our repair mechanisms take a, do a heck of a good job of automatically taking care of it. In addition, we now know that uh, DNA damage from radiation is the minor cause. Right. The major cause being from oxidation of the food we eat. It's chemistry. Um, chemistry. Yeah, that's, that's, very, that's a very good observation. Yeah. And the foods we choose to eat. Yeah. <laughs> So that's very good, thank you. And you, I wanted you to, to sum up with uh, just saying the titles of some of your other books. Oh, and my first book, uh, for, for 38 summers, I was a bush pilot in northern Canada and Alaska. Okay. And I have seen all those changes in the far north that we are told about regarding global warming and climate change. Um, because of my travels and my programs, people said you have to write a book. Well, I've been writing articles forever. So I wrote a book, it was a bestseller. Um, I had so many demands for a sequel that I wrote uh, the True North uh, Exploring the Great Wilderness by Bush Plain is the first book. The sequel that so many requested is Back to the Barrens on the Wing with Da Vinci and Friends. They are both loaded with science history because nothing is a better vehicle for talking about science than aviation. Uh, you have Bernoulli in the wings. You have uh, Wegener in Continental Drift. You have uh, Torricelli in the Barometer. Um, you have uh, Faraday in the Magnetos that operate the engine. Um, plate tectonics, that thing is in Wegener. Um, it, it's, it's just, and being a science person, I knew all that. So I just put all this in this adventure travel book. And that's the reason it was a bestseller. I've always also been a study of uh, religion. I've studied a long time, and I've been a VP of the American Humanist Association. And so my uh, second book was Time Traveling with Science and the Saints, which compares the long, which describes the long hostility between science and technology. The fourth book was Eyes Wide Open, um, Living, Laughing, Loving, and Learning in a Religion Troubled World very pro-science. And of course the fifth book, and I say the most important, is the current one, Unintended Consequences. Very good.